This presentation was created as an attempt to help people understand the principles or the recurring themes in Jeffrey Ewan's work. In looking at principles that underlie Jeffrey's work, we need to remember that if we call them principles, we will actually be missing the point and the possibility of deeper understanding. While Jeffrey does outline treatment protocols, and there does seem to be some system to his way of thinking, when I first met Jeffrey, he clearly stated that his intent in teaching was not protocols or systems, but rather to open our minds and to cultivate our own sense of the medicine and to make it our own, to create our own resonance, as he likes to put it, with the medicine and our understanding of the human condition. When I first met Jeffrey in 1993, and for a few years afterwards, he was not yet teaching different schools of Chinese medicine, but a more particular approach which he said came from his studies with his grandfather. Later, as more people flocked to Jeffrey and asked for a classical approach to Chinese medicine, he started teaching different approaches, different schools. When he did that, he would often say that each school has a particular view and thus treatment ideas, and that those ideas are not necessarily the only ones, and that even though he was teaching a particular school's approach, it did not mean that he was advocating it, but merely expounding on it. He would often say that he reserved the right to contradict himself and to not expect one line of logic. The human condition can be seen in many ways. We make a choice as to which lens to put on. Hopefully, we are intelligent and flexible enough to put on useful lenses and, more importantly, flexible and intelligent enough to change lenses when necessary. It is important to remember the principle of Indra's net, the Bao Wang, which underlies Chinese medicine, the one in the all and the all in the one, or the macrocosm and the microcosm reflect each other. Every jewel in the net of Indra reflects all the other jewels. They cannot be separated. I find that the biggest mistake people make in trying to understand Jeffrey and in applying his teaching lies in trying too hard. We latch on to certain ideas and we want them to be very fixed and very much in a certain way. When we describe the meridian system and say that the eight extraordinary meridians, for example, are the conduits of Yuan Qi, that does not mean that all Yuan level issues must use an eight extraordinary channel to address it. You could, in fact, use a sinew meridian to address it. It may sound counterintuitive since the sinews are supposed to conduct Wei Qi and not Yuan Qi, but due to the principle of interpenetration, we can, in fact, use any channel because each channel contains all the others. In the late 1990s, I wrote a number of articles expounding on Jeffrey's presentation on acupuncture especially on the acupuncture meridians. These can be found still on the web. In particular, this presentation is rather similar to an article that was published in 2000 called In Search of a Philosophical Medicine, which is also available on the web. I find that it is useful to keep the following principles in mind when studying with Jeffrey. However, it is important to note that this is my interpretation of a list which Jeffrey never created. The first idea or principle is that, that of three levels, the human communicating between heaven and earth, thus outlining three levels of existence, heaven, human, person, and earth. These would, in our view of anatomy, correspond to Wei, Ying, and Yuan Qi. Another idea is that the human entity is interacting with the world around it, and those interactions create opportunities for defining the individual as well as for conflict and for disease. We are destined to take in the world, interact, learn, and what Jeffrey terms differentiate, that which we like or dislike about the world. Anatomy and physiology 
are the description of the human trajectory. They describe the pathway to what we might call fulfilling our destiny. Pathology is operating along the same trajectory, except that it moves us in what we perceive as an undesirable direction. That is why we, in Chinese medicine, tend to describe pathology in terms of how it follows, penetrates the different channels. The channels describe the anatomy and the physiology, the processes and purpose of life, and thus they also describe the pathology. What we call the climatic factors or external factors, wind, cold, heat, dampness, are not just external factors. They are not just pathogens. They are also processes in the body that attempt to respond to the environment. For example, we become cold as a way to not respond to change. The climatic factors can thus also be internal factors that in order to be resolved need to be addressed not just by warming what is called kind of strategy, but by evaluating and addressing why it is that the organism is generating it. The human body adapts to the environment and responds to it. The response is an attempt to free oneself, as the body-mind perceives its, its trajectory at that point. The response can be a pathology or it can be healthy, but it is the way the body-mind organism is trying to adjust to the environment. Ultimately, the real disease is in diminishing our flexibility in responding and adapting to the world. Since we're all destined to die, the real pathology is not being sick or dying, but being unable to adapt, accept, by narrowing our definition of what we can and cannot handle. This is what Jeffrey liked to call hardening of the attitudes. With time, in accordance with how our interactions with the world went, we define ourselves more narrowly, separating ourselves more and more from the world. For me, that has always marked the real disease, the danger of being overly protective of what I think I am, instead of opening myself up to all possibilities. Note, this principle is really an extension of the second principle that life is about interacting with the world. It states that our failure to interact fully and narrowing is what creates disease. It also implies that vitalizing our attitudes, vitalizing the blood, is possibly the ultimate goal in therapy. In treating people, another principle I had observed Jeffrey apply is one I call not knowing. Although Jeffrey seems to have an inexhaustible knowledge and has an incredible capacity to relate to people and understand them, my observation has been that he makes a diagnosis that is rooted in a very deep understanding of the person's life. But in offering a treatment, he basically tries to tap in, to shake up the issue, and then to observe where things go. I call this not knowing, because we may think we're very clear about the problem being X in the Y level, and we want to move it in a certain direction. But we may or may not be able to do that. And even if we are successful in making the shift we wanted, the body-mind organism will now have to generate a new strategy to deal with a new shift. So that means we have to prod the issue again. Jeffrey often talked about treating in order to produce a change and to follow that change, meaning reevaluate the condition once the change took place. Jeffrey often asked us to ponder the question of whether we are supposed to play with or determine people's destiny. Of course, we all have our own answers, and Jeffrey, in treating, would sometimes display contradictory answers. But in seeing his approach to treatment, I took it that in some ways our role as physicians is to provoke change, hopefully in an intelligent and considerate manner, in order to shift where the person is. But the shift and the ultimate destiny are not determined by us. Let's look at the first principle. 
as the human is communicating between heaven and earth, naturally and in accordance to the one reflecting the all and the all reflected in the one, all three will also reflect in us and be guiding principles, trajectories of life. In the human body, this becomes Wei, Ying, and Yuan Qi levels. The Wei level is that which interacts spontaneously with the world. The character Wei to defend is movement, and inside is the character for opposition. Defensive Qi could also mean offensive Qi. It is an instinctual response, not mediated by thoughts, feelings, etc. As in when we sweat when it is hot, or when we shiver when it is cold. We are not trying to shiver or sweat. We are not controlling it. We simply do this in a response to the environment. Tian, nature. The yin level is the level of nourishment, of cognitive response. Ying means to manage, to construct, or to nourish. The character is composed of the glowing campfires of an army battalion. This is what nourishes the self, be it food, thoughts, or emotions. The Yuan level is the realm of survival, in the sense of the will to survive. It is the level of the constitution. Yuan is the source, the fountainhead of water, the origin. That is, we have some origin that propels us into the world, like the fountainhead propels the water into the river, creating its initial trajectory. The Yuan level is that which represents our original patterns, our connection to our ancestors, where we came from, and our destiny. In the terminology of Wei and Ying, conflict plays the role. Wei is about confronting the outside world. This may be as a defense or as an attack, or just an exploration, which is still an attack. Ying provides nourishment. That is what is used by an army. The purpose of the nourishment is to move forward in conquering or defending against the world. This demonstrates the second principle, that life is about interacting with the world and using those interactions in our becoming who we are. Let's visit the second principle. Life is initiated by the interaction of heaven and earth, creating a source, the fountainhead, which becomes a river that flows, being influenced by the terrain it passes, and eventually arriving at the ocean, becoming part of the larger water. It is that path, negotiating the terrain, curving around obstacles, flowing faster, slower, wider, more narrowly, waterfalls, etc. That is what the river becomes known as. That is how human life is also. We become who we are as we interact with our environment. We seek to fulfill our destiny through our interactions. We get nourishment from those interactions. Those can be in the form of physical food, physical stimuli, as well as mental and emotional food and stimuli. Basically, we can sum it with the phrase that life is the transmutation of the Jing our source energy, into Shen, experiences, memories, through the combustion power of Qi, our interactions. We can see this as a journey moving up the spine of the Jing being consumed and becoming Shen that is stored as experiences, as memories in the brain, which is the marrow. When all the Jing, the fuel, is exhausted, the process ends and what is left is that Shen that has been cultivated through the process. In the process of life, there are certain fundamental requirements which build on each other. Jeffrey describes those in terms of the trajectory, the time clock of the primary meridians, which are concerned with postnatal chi. First, the organism must survive. We need to breathe and to eat. This is represented by the first four meridians of the primary meridians flow. The lungs, our breath, the large intestine, and the stomach and spleen, our digestion. 
With that, we can move, interact, which involves the heart and small intestine, providing the awareness, the bladder and the kidney channels, which provide the skeletal support for movement. The heart channel describes very clearly exploring, moving towards the world. It unifies the hand and the mouth. A child reaches out to things in the world and examines them by placing them onto his tongue, an extension of the heart channel, making the world part of himself and then swallowing or just recognizing them, possibly throwing them out of his mouth. Of course, this phase is usually cut short by mommy objecting to the placing of objects in the mouth. Later on, our love will seek to unify the heart channel in the same way and to express love with our tongues. The last four meridians, the pericardium, sanjiao, gallbladder and liver, represent self-differentiation. We learn from our movement into the world and what we consider good or bad for us, what we liked, what we disliked, what we want to keep seeking and what we want to avoid. This is also detoxifying, to determine what is beneficial and what is harmful and to reject that which is harmful. That is the role of the heart protector and the liver. We can also say that our responses to the world and its challenges can correspond to the three levels. The kidney yuan level is who I am intrinsically. The ying or spleen level is how I am affected by society and its values and expectations. And the way level is how I react spontaneously. This would be in the domain of the lungs and the liver. The process of life as unfolding the three domains of Yuan, Ying, and Wei involves conflict. A highly cultivated person is able to say, sail smoothly with the challenges of life, the world, and move in total harmony with the nature. This generally requires a very strong development, a cultivation of virtue, de, of our capacity to be one with the Tao of all things, without discrimination. For most of us, there is conflict in our attempt to contour, assimilate, and learn from the world. The back shoe points describe this. They describe conflict. Recognizing that life is the interaction of yin-yang and begins with a breath and also requires the jing from parents, we have the lungs, the metal shoe point, at the top, and the kidneys, water shoe point, at the base establishing the interaction of yin-yang. Du nine, chi yang, reaching yang, is that which can flip between yin-yang. It acts as our axis, around which the control cycle of the five movements of yin-yang, the five phases, move. Above the du nine line is the heart fire shu, which controls the metal lung, which is the next shu point, that is the one further away from Du Nine, the axis. Below is the liver wood, which controls the next phase that is below, away from Du Nine, the spleen earth, which controls mortar, kidney, the phase that is further below. This is a statement that the shoe to transport, to move, the character is that one of a boat traveling down a river, always involves conflict always involves control. We saw how the concepts of life are reflected in the anatomy, in the description of the meridians, in the statement made by the primary meridians as expressing the purpose of postnatal existence, to survive, to interact, to differentiate, and the back shoe points as the interaction of yin-yang and of conflict. Let's take a deeper look and see how the meridian system reflects the requirements of human existence, reflecting the three levels of Wei, Ying, and Yuan. We can then start to look at how anatomy and physiology describe human destiny and trajectory. The meridians are Jing. Jing is the word for sutra, a classic, a canon. That is what sutras things together, creating the web of the cloth. Thus, the meridians are not just channels, some extra system out there. They are classics, 
They are sutras. They are the essence of the body-mind, the fabric of our existence. When we say that the meridians are jing, we mean that life is the meridians and that there cannot be life without them. There is a bit of a standard to have five classics in Chinese culture. This comes from the Confucian Hu Jing, five classics. Five being a number that represents the four directions and the center, hence a number of completion. Following this idea, we have five meridian systems. The primary meridians, the Jing Mai, the senior meridians, the Jing Ding, the Lua or connecting, the Lua Mai, the divergence, the Jing Bie, and the eight extraordinary meridians, the Qi Jing Ban Mai. We can say that the Wei Qi, the instinctual reaction, interaction, is the domain of the sinews. That's the domain of the sinew meridians. Or we can say that it is in the domain of the lungs, the skin, and the liver, which corresponds to sinews. The ying qi, the cognitive interaction response, would be the spleen, the medium of the blood, and the pericardium, the regulator of the blood. Both the primary and the lower channels can be considered to be ying qi channel systems. The yuan qi, the realm of survival, of intrinsic response, is the domain of the eight extraordinary meridians, or the kidney and the sanja. Immediately, we see that this is not an exclusive, all-or-nothing kind of idea, but rather an inclusive, embracing one. Although we say that the primary meridians are representing postnatal qi and are in the ying qi domain, we are also saying that within the primary system, we also have a connection to each of the three levels, the way through the lungs and the liver, the ying via the spleen and pericardium, and the yuan via the kidney and the san jiao. In expanding this to allow more flexibility and connections amongst the three levels, we can look more closely and say that the sinews conduct Wei Qi, the eight extraordinary meridians conduct Yuan Qi, that the divergent meridians communicate Wei and Yuan Qi. Both the lower and the primary meridians are conduits of Ying Qi. However, the lower tend to be messengers between Ying and Wei and between Ying and Yuan. The transverse law, which connect the lower to the Yuan source of the Biao Li paired meridian, connect the yin and the yuan, while the so-called longitudinal law, the part of the lower channel that moves up the arm and the leg, communicates the yin and the wei. In order to understand further the role of the different meridian systems, we need to look at the fourth and fifth principles. The climatic factors as internal responses being the fourth and the movement of pathology and adaptation of the body being the fifth so-called principle. And, of course, they cannot be separated from each other or the other principles, except for the purposes of conceptualizing. Let's take a lot closer look at what we usually call the external or climatic factors. Life is about change. Without change, there is no life, no growth. Life is a process which means it is about movement, and movement means that things are changing. The I Ching, a classic of change, is for many people the essence of Chinese understanding of life. Yi is change, or easy. The picture is like a lizard. It keeps moving and changing colors in accordance to the surroundings. Note that Yi, change, is very similar to Yang. Take away the left side of yang, and the character is virtually the same, with only one stroke difference. Both have the sun above and the same character at the bottom. So life is about change, about yang. Wind, feng, is an insect that penetrates everywhere. The wind scatters the insects everywhere. Wind is that which penetrates. Wind initiates change entices change. We can call any invitation to change, be it external or internal, 
wind. We encounter wind constantly at every moment, since change is happening at every moment. Wind, change, is the spearhead of all disease. It is also the spearhead of all growth, of all life. <clears throat> How do we react to the invitation to change? The body-mind will have a tendency to respond or not respond to change in order to maintain what it receives to be its balance, its homeostasis. We might contract away from the possibility of change. This would be cold. Cold, Han, is usually seen as a person stuffing straw in the house, under the roof, to keep warm, insulating, pushing away. Jeffrey interprets the character as a man being separated from his field, from his work, and thus crying. Cold separates us. We insulate ourselves against it and we contract. This is one response to change. Another response can be the heat one. We welcome the change, and in fact we try and move as rapidly as we can with it. This produces heat, too much movement. Or we may be unsure, hesitant about what to do. This would be dampness. We're being slowed down. In cold, we're actively contracting and resisting. In dampness, we're being slowed down by hesitation. Thus, we see that what we normally describe as external factors can also be seen as internal or as responses, the way the body copes with or attempts to cope with change, a challenge. That challenge can be physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual. Let's look how the body adapts and the penetration of disease. At first, the enticement to change is first on the Wei Qi level. We might not even understand that we're encountering an issue in our lives. We might accept it or we might fight it without much awareness of our response. Later, our response might be one of cold, slowing down the change, hot, moving towards it faster than invited, or damp, moving both towards and halting at the same time. If we have not accepted the encounter change, we shall start developing greater awareness of its existence. Slowly, we might become more and more irritated by it. Now that it is in our consciousness, it is in the yin level. The response of cold, heat, or dampness becomes pronounced. We start to invest blood in the struggle, the way we digest the world, the spleen, is being affected. An emotional disposition is being affected also. Now, it is no longer quite so easy to ignore or expel the problem. It is now a pathogen, meaning any issue, emotional or physical, that feels foreign to our lives. In this stage, there will typically be pain, mental or physical, and the beginning of disruption of function. As the irritation increases, we may opt to harmonize the problem, that is, we learn to live with it. The problem is not gone, but it is manageable. It is no longer a pronounced effect on our, on our lives. Perhaps it is dormant. Perhaps we simply learn to live with a problem. Perhaps we suppress its symptoms. At some stage, we are unable to maintain this harmony, or we have become so accustomed and we suppress the problem so strongly that it starts to become part of who we are. This is the Yuan level. Physically, this may show up as damage to actual structural organs, while mentally, it may show as repression and a change in our outlook that is no longer conscious but has become part of who we are. This is where we start to associate ourselves with our pain, or see the problem as ourselves, or the opposite. We develop a feeling of total separation from the problem, as if a demon has taken hold of our destiny. Now our destiny is being rewritten. Another way to describe this process of penetration is through the concepts of latent heat and latent cold. 
Once the pathogen has entered the yin level, our reaction is no longer spontaneous. Now the enticement for change, the wind or wei qi, is in the blood and might disrupt what we perceive as our normal function. The body mobilizes the blood in order to suppress the pathogen. This can be done through defensive emotions, changes in behavior, or relatively small changes in function and structure. For example, the building of extra capillaries, or hardening and closure of blood vessels, reduced function so the body is no longer at an optimal level, etc. This is called latent heat, because we have taken that which is young, change, movement, which are hot by nature, and suppressed it, perhaps encapsulated it with blood. This is the stage that we might observe the lower vessels on the surface, or we might see phlegm nodules. At some point, we will not have enough blood to handle the issue and suppress it. At this stage, we start to mobilize the jing in order to keep the suppression. This stage is called latent cold, as it is the energy of the kidneys called our core that is being utilized. Here, greater substantiation takes place. The encapsulated pathogen begins to become more consolidated. Fibroids and tumors are being formed. The loss of function is more pronounced and grosser structural changes occur, even changes in the DNA. Eventually, the jing is unable to contain the pathogen and metastasis begins. The pathogen, heat movement, is no longer held and it starts to spread. When we view pathology as following the same trajectory as physiology, and that a disease is not just the pathogen, but also the response that has a trajectory, we can become more sophisticated in our treatment methods. When we view a disease as only a pathogen, we really have no choice but to oppose it. This is the TCM approach of warm the cold, cool the heat, drain the dampness. When we see that these are expressions of the body's response, we can choose to do more than the pose. We can try and move the, the direction of the disease differently. We can either aid or direct the body's response so as to help the body best cope, being by expelling, adjusting, etc. It simply gives us more tools. This is why Jeffrey is so interested in the different meridian systems as representing the different levels. It allows us a model by which we can use the meridian systems to entice or push a pathogen to different levels. Let's recall the basic model. The Wei level is mediated by the sinew meridians. The Ying level is mediated by the primary and lua meridians. The Yuan level is mediated by the eight extraordinary meridians. The lower vessels communicate between the Wei and the Ying and between the Ying and the Yuan. The divergence communicate between the Wei and the Yuan without the involvement of the Ying. If we can identify the meridian system the problem is currently traveling at and move it to a different one as a process of resolution, we can do a lot more than just cool the heat, drain the dampness, or warm the cold. We can actually direct the process, or rather we can create new enticements that, should they work, will direct the process. The eight extraordinary meridians are the meridian system of the UN level, the Constitution. The eight extraordinaries deal with issues that are formed very early on in life, the first seven or eight year cycles. We look to treat these meridians when an issue is on a constitutional level and has roots in gestation or early childhood. They express the basic building blocks, the patterns that are required to have life. Jeffrey uses the analogy of building a house. First, we have to have a plan, a blueprint. This is the Chong, 
that which moves with force, with seriousness. My blueprint includes things like my parents, the culture into which I was born. For example, I was not born into the Italian Renaissance era, so my blueprint is obviously different than, say, Leonardo da Vinci. It also includes my ethnicity, my gender, sexual orientation, etc. If I am uncomfortable with my blueprint, this is an issue that involves the charm. It can be issues like, I do not like my nose, I am uncomfortable with my so-called assigned gender, or I wish I was born in a different era. The Chang is about as close as the Chinese medicine gets to the Tibetan or Indian idea of the central channel, the one that is deep inside the body, neither on the front nor the back. Once we have a plan, we need the physical materials to construct our house. This is the Ren. The Ren represents our connection to mother, to bonding, to nourishment. A child gets nourishment from mommy, and it is when both mother and child's friend channels face each other, touching, that the child gets nourishment from the mother's breast. In all traditional societies, the child's friend is always in contact with the mother. Even if the child is on the mother's back, it is the baby's belly that faces mother. Only recently have the Swedes come up with the idea that the baby will be more stimulated by having him or her face away from mommy and have the wren channel exposed. Note that the baby on the right side is not as peaceful as the one on the left, even though it is meant to be a happy baby picture. Pathologies of the wren have to do with whether we had enough satiation, enough contact with our mother figure, too much protection, or having been sent out to the world without enough maternal support. Ren my issues can be accumulating dampness, for example, in asthma or in fibroids, as an attempt by the body to get more Ren. This can happen when the mother is overprotective and the habit of having all this extra Ren becomes established. But it can also be the result of being sent out too fast, too soon, and not having gotten enough Ren, and then spending a lifetime searching for more Ren. With the materials in place, we now need to do the actual construction. This is the do, the governing meridian, that which supervises. When we look at the spine, we see that the child starts to activate do 14 to do 16 area as they start to lift the head and see further out. And then they start to activate do 4 ming men area and start to move out, crawl towards these new horizons. Up until then, the baby sees herself as an inseparable part of mommy. When the do is activated, the baby starts to explore the world on their own, separating from the mother figure. The do represents our ability to move out or forward in life. Once we built the house, each part of the house will take on a function, a role. The kitchen, the toilet, the sitting area, the sleeping area, and within each one of those areas, there could be many roles also. For example, the bedroom can be a chamber of love. It can also be a chamber of fighting. It can be a place of dreams and soaring imagination, or a refuge for rest, or it may double up as your office. In the human organism, there are many roles we take on. We might call them personalities, or masks, or roles. As a son, I am taking on a role and a personality that is different than that of a father. As a teacher, I am wearing a somewhat different hat, a different role than when I am a practitioner. And those are different than the role I play when I am a friend, a lover, a student, a co-worker, a leader, a cog in a social machine, etc., etc. We put on many, many hats every day. We take on many roles. That requires a certain flexibility. This ability is embodied in the Chao vessels. The character Chao has the foot and the character for disguise, which also happens to mean tall. The Chao vessels are how we use our heels to become tall, physically and mentally, or 
how we send ourselves off the ground to become the role we need to become at that moment. The yin chao represents how we're able to take on different roles with regards to ourselves, while the yang chao is with regards to the world. Jeffrey likes to express this as, how do I heal to myself and how do I heal to the world? He uses as an example a person who has gone through a trauma, an attack or a rape. The person can now see themselves as a victim and this will change their chow vessels. A person who directs it to themselves, for example, they are blaming themselves, saying it was their fault, that they were stupid, that they were brought, they'd brought it on themselves, they should not have gone to where they went, where this trauma happened. That will be the yin chow person. The person who blames the world and now feels the world is a bad place is a yang chow person. Recall that the so-called perfect or smooth Taoist has no judgments about the world or the person. Nature just is what it is. The world is neither good nor bad. It just is. And it is our ability to accept and work with it that determines the health of our chow vessels. The yin chow is being how we see ourselves can also be described as the meditation channel. However, note that Jeffrey sometimes describes the yin way also as the meditation channel. Yin chao starts at Chao Hai, kidney six, reflecting on the ocean of life. It then moves on to kidney eight, Chao Xin, the intersection of trust. We start the process by shining light on life, our own life. And as we reflect on it, we start to develop trust in the process of life. The channel proceeds to go through the two common obstacles we have in life. The genitals, representing our desires and our attachments, and the diaphragm, representing our capacity or aspiration to open up fully to all that is. We then arrive at stomach 12, the empty basin, the depression that is waiting to be filled. Having reflected on life, developed trust, looked and accepted our obstacles, where do we go to now? We arrive at stomach nine, Ren Yin, to welcome humanity, to welcome myself, so I can now have bright eyes or understanding eyes, you be one, Jing Ming. We can do a somewhat similar analysis of point names on the Yang Chao also which has to do with how we see ourselves in the context of the world, how we extend ourselves out to the world. We start at Shen Mai, UB62, the extending vessel. How do I extend myself? Rooting into UB61, the participating servant, meaning doing chores. We have to interact with the world, and those are the, our so-called chores, the work. We then rise up to Nao Shu, small intestine 10, the arm Shu, and Jiang Gu, large intestine 15, the shoulder bone. This indicates that in our roles in the world, we will be handling the world, manipulating it. That is what the arms do. But the Nao in small intestine 10 also breaks down to the character for flesh, the radical for, fle for flesh, plus soft. Perhaps that is a reminder that our manipulation of the world needs to be soft, flexible, while the bone in large intestine 15 suggests a hard counterpart. We then rise to welcome humanity, to welcome ourselves, stomach 9, Ren Yin, moving on to stomach 4, Di Zang, the earth store, implying perseverance. The earth has a lot of patience. Moving on to stomach three, Jiu Yao, the big Yao, which implies the capacity for movement. Though Yao does mean a hole in the bone, as usually is translated, the character also implies to soar. It implies our capacity for quick movement. We then arrive at stomach one, supporting tears. As we stand up in the world, we are bound to have regrets. We have made mistakes. Arriving at UB1 to have bright or understanding eyes, but then homing onto gallbladder 20, Feng Chi, 
the wind pool, a point for gathering wind, a point for acting out in the world. Li Shijian does not name Yubi 59, Fu Yang, or Gobladder 29, Zhu Liao, in the trajectory of the Yang Chao. But that does not mean we cannot consider them to be part of that trajectory. They do add to the context of standing up to the world. The Wei Vessels, a representation of the seven and eight year cycles. A house, after it is built, gets to be updated every so often. It starts to change. In the human body, this is described as the seven and eight year cycles of Su Wen chapter one. Every decade or so, we're likely to have a different focus, a different kind of main process. Way is to hold together, to link, to maintain, or to preserve. How do we make the changes in the long cycles? How do we maintain ourselves over the major fluctuations, the major periods of our lives? Internally, that would be yin way, while in relationship with the world, that would be the yang way. Since they link, the way vessels will go through all the yin channels and home to the ren, the sea of ren, of the yin, that is the yin way. Or it will go through all the yang channels and home to the du, the sea of the yang, which is the trajectory of the yang way. The yin way starts with kidney nine, chu bin. Chu is the house, or to construct. Bin is a guest, as in one who brings gifts. How do we construct a house for ourselves, where we can be good guests in our own home? Or how do we kick out the unwanted guests, such as our obsessions, our addictions, etc.? We then connect with the spleen, the Tai Yang, at spleen 13, Fu Shi, the exchange home. As we move through life, we need to exchange, to let go, so we can truly reside in our own selves. Spleen 15, Da Heng, the great horizontal, so that we can create balance. And then Spleen 13, 16, Fu Ai, the abdominal sadness. As we let go, there may be sadness or grief. Spleen 14 is often cited as a Yin Wei point also. This is Fu Jie, the abdominal binding, which we can look at as a knot that is pain or the collecting of cycles in the body. The character Fu, the abdomen, is the flesh radical plus Fu to repeat, indicating cycles, which are more clearly indicated in the next points. Traditionally, liver 14 comes next. However, Jeffrey tends to put liver 13 here. This is Zhang Men, the camphor gate. Camphor is what used to what is used to seal coffins with the idea that the camphor smell will wake up the dead ones as they arrive at the next cycle of birth and death. Liver 14 is gate cycles. Again, we're looking at cycles, periods of our lives, beginnings and endings. We then home to the Ren at Ren 22, Tian Tu, the celestial chimney. Tu, chimney is like a dog that rushes out of its cave. This suggests that when we have established our cave, our home, we can move out of it and move out to the world. The last point is Ren 23, Lian Chuan, the upright or honorable spring. Lian also has the character for a house as well as to connect, reminding us of the function of the Yin Wei, to link through the seven, eight year cycles to clear the house of accumulations of the last cycle and make us ready for the next one. The trajectory of the Yang Wei starts with Jin Men, UB 63, the gate of metal, the gate to the outside. Continuing to Gallbladder 35, Yang Jiao, the intersection of Yang. From here, it will rise up to meet the Tai Yang, its more intestine 10, the Yang Ming at large intestine 14, circle in the shoulder to meet the Shao Yang at San Jiao 13, Na Hui, meeting up the upper arm, San Jiao 15, Tian Liao, the heavenly Liao, Liao again indicates rapid action capacity, and then Gallbladder 21, Jian Jin, the shoulder well, making linkage with our ability to manipulate the world, the role of the hands 
through the shoulders. Then it goes up to the head, going through gallbladder 13 to all the way through 20 and do 16. Li Shi Chen describes it as homing into gallbladder 13, Ben Shen, the root of the Shen, meaning the brain, while others say that it is do 16 that is the final destination. Either trajectory brings it to the brain, so that the linking of all our external experiences, our interactions with the world, the yang, come to reside in the brain, in our memories, our shen. Finally, in any house, there is going to be discarded stuff, leftovers, accumulations, garbage to be disposed of. This is the daimai, the siphoning off of accumulations. We hold on to things for a long time, stuffing them under the belt. This is dampness accumulating, all the unresolved stuff of our lives, which at some point will be released, consciously or unconsciously. Jeffrey likes to make the point that Li Shi Jen has moved Gallbladder 26 from its traditional location that used to be totally on the side to the current textbook location under the 11th rib. Because of the relationship of the dye to dampness, and therefore to the spleen, Li Shi Jen wanted to include liver 13, the mu of the spleen, and the meeting of the tsang, in the trajectory of the dai mai. In order to make the trajectory simple, gallbladder 26 now had to be moved to be under liver 13, then, rather than on the side, which would have made the channel of dai mai go backwards and then forwards. A few points to remember with the extraordinary meridians. The first is that they are not used for just any Yuan Qi level issue, but primarily for issues that have roots in early childhood. There is a constant unresolved debate as to whether we can in fact affect the constitution, the Yuan level, with acupuncture, which is a moving modality, or even with any modality, and if we do have that ability, whether we should. Technically. Jeffrey reminds us that the opening coupled coins are not the way into the Yuan level. The use of the master couple extraordinary points is more of a way of looking at the sections of an octagonal body. Jeffrey suggests that to affect the constitution, we need to use the actual trajectory of the extraordinary meridian we wish to tap into, not just its opening points. Ling Shu, Chapter 10, describes the pathways of the primary meridians. It says that they are able to decide death and birth, the residence of hundred diseases. They mediate deficiency and excess. They are neither approved nor penetrated. This enforces the understanding that the primary meridians are the conduits of postnatal, ying qi. We already looked at the primary meridians as conduits of postnatal qi, and as defining the process of postnatal life. Surviving, represented by the lungs, the large intestine, stomach, and spleen. Interacting, represented by the heart, small intestine, bladder, and kidney. And separating or differentiating, represented by the pericardium, the sun jiao, the gallbladder, and the liver. Life is about decay. We are born to die. Life starts with metal, with breath. It ends with death, and thus with rebirth, which is wood. The primary meridians follow a trajectory that is the reversal of the five phases creative cycle, that is, a decay cycle. From lungs and large intestine, the metal, we move to earth, stomach and spleen, then back again to fire, heart and small intestine. Life is about interacting, which will involve conflict. Fire represents our desires, so once we reach fire, it is required that we visit its opposite, water. This represents yin-yang interaction, the conflict that creates life, and so we arrive at water, the bladder and the kidney channels. Moving back to fire, pericardium and sanjiao, and continuing in the decay cycle to wood, gallbladder and liver, and on to a new cycle, a new birth. This trajectory also illustrates that life begins with breath, the lungs, and creates form, earth, to explore our desires, fire, 
so we can return to who we truly are, our origin, water, and then on to a new birth, wood. Metal, the yin from within the yang, and wood, the spark of yang from within the yin, represent the beginning and end of a cycle, and they are thus a sign the start of the meridians. The yin meridians jing well points, the first point, is assigned the yang, wood initiation, and the yang jing well points are assigned to metal, the yin initiation. In accordance with the principle that pathology and physiology reflect each other, the system also shows the progression of a pathogen. A pathogen would be anything we encounter in the world that we are unable to handle at that time. Starting with a lung channel, the first symptoms will be wind. When we are unable or unwilling to change, we suffer. As the pathogen internalizes, it is converted to wind heat, moving through the large intestine channel, affecting the upper region, the eyes, mouth, teeth, and throat. The heat begins to internalize. It is heat because it is an invitation to change, yang. Now it moves into the stomach meridian, and the heat moving in starts to disturb the blood, affecting the mental state and causes bleeding. As the heat intensifies, there is sweating and infections. The sore throat is now infected. As the heat spreads and intensifies, it starts to consume the flesh, the four limbs. This is the spleen channel and its symptoms of wasting, whey, atrophy. Once the four limbs have been affected, all the meridians, that is the whole organism, have been affected and will no longer function the same way. This describes the external path of the pathogen from exterior towards the interior. The external branches have been affected now, and the heat is now moving in to become fixated and habituated. This is the process of the next four channels, the heart, small intestine, bladder, and kidney. The pathogen is now settled and is taking over the interior domain of the body. The heat is trapped in the chest with restlessness and palpitations. This is the heart channel phase. The small intestine is our last chance to separate what is turbid and what is pure. The heat moves into the abdomen, creating abdominal knots and irritable bowels. The pathogen will now start to get suppressed into the bone, moving towards latent cold. We can say that UB11, the meeting point of the bones, is involved in this stage. The heat in the small intestine changes the microflora and chronic degenerative diseases can be started here. Now the body is mobilizing the jing. Deficiency is setting in as the body attempts to build up latent cold to encapsulate the heat. Yin is accumulated and phlegm swellings result. In the bladder channel phase, we now see cystitis. The heat has penetrated the jing level, and there can be also headaches and body pains as the body is attempting to push out the pathogen, the heat. As the jing gets mobilized, the kidney phase of the process is being expressed. Areas associated with jing the genitals, the low back, the bones, become cold and stiff. The body attempts to keep yin to ward off the pathogen, and edema results. Now the constitution has been threatened. The next four channels represent an effort to push things out, to find a solution. At the pericardium level, the diaphragm and chest have become unstable. There is five palm heat, but the joints are cold. This is an attempt to divert into the joints. There is irritability, panic, and as the attempt to push out the heat intensifies, there could be a feeling of running piglet chi, the attempt to move up and out from the kidneys. By the Sanjiao phase, not only the diaphragm has been destabilized, but the communication between the three jiaos is compromised. Above, there is a constant attempt to vent out, manifesting as ear, eye, or joint problems. These are areas that relate to the jing, and they are also openings to the outside. Below, there is accumulation of abdominal masses. 
There is constant sweating as a result of this chronic attempt to ward off the pathogen. The pathogen will now settle in. It will, neither para will either paralyze it, be harmonious and become part of who we are, or we might still push it out. This is the gallbladder stage. The pushing out from this deep state creates intense alternating fevers and chills and vomiting. Internalizing the pathogen creates goiter, nodules, and swellings. Harmonizing with the pathogen now creates deficiencies and tumors. The final stage is the liver domain. The pathogen has taken over. What was an invitation to change, what was wind, has now become internal wind. The body attempts to push it down, moving it into the genital regions. And the symptom of that in the text is hernia, the pushing down. The changed gene is now being transmuted from the genital regions up into the eyes and the brain, expressed in the liver channel vertex headache and vision problems. And so we see that the primary meridians express both the purpose of postnatal qi as well as what happens when there is a failure in the process of postnatal qi in interacting with the world. The description of pathologies for the channels, both for the primary and the lower channels, is quite important. It is an attempt to describe the progression of disease, to give us a roadmap of the possibilities, the junctions, the decision-making that keeps happening in the disease process. When we look at therapeutic options, we can look at these and see where the body-mind organism has been unable to cope. And rather than just try to push the pathogen backwards, we can look at what, what the failures in a previous level have been and try to address those prior to inviting the pathogen back to that level so that the body will now have a capacity to deal with it. The law vessels clearly carry blood, hence they are clearly related to the yin level. However, the law are also vessels that have different appearances and do not always manifest. They are serving as bridges to communicate between the Wei and Ying level and the Ying and Yuan level. Because the lower vessels take on different appearances, different colors, as well as non-appearances, they are a bit more elusive to grasp. We can view them as serving a number of different functions. We know that the lower communicate between the exterior and interior, their substance is blood, hence interior, but their appearance is exterior. As communicators of exterior and interior, they also show the progression of pathology, from the lungs towards the liver, into the blood, and then to the other three laws, the Ren Lua, the Du Lua, and the Great Lua. Once the pathogen has moved into the liver law, into the blood, it is moving towards the Jing, into the genital and into the constitution, the ren and the du. The law buffer off pathogens by using blood. Jeffrey calls this financing of our struggles with blood. You may recall that the basic terminology of Wei and Ying Qi are army battle terms. This financing with blood allows us to harmonize with the problem. It creates nodules and stasis but it prevents a threat to the Constitution. We have a number of ways to look at the laws. First, as carriers of blood, we can look at the law system as a continuum representing our emotional life, our responses to emotions. This is demonstrated by the symptoms of the lower channels and their destinations. For example, that the lung law moves to the palm the spleen to the gut, the heart to the tongue, and the liver to the genitals. Starting with the lungs, to have an emotion, we need to interact, to have a stimulus, a trigger. Lung lower excess symptomology is hot palms. We are eager to engage. Deficiency is frequent urination, a weakness in the lower dantian, a lack of engagement. Once triggered, we need to sense the world. The large intestine lower represents our sensing the world through the mouth, the teeth. 
This is not quite swallowing or digesting, just mere sensing. In other words, there is no judgment, no habituation, no stasis yet. If we feel or sense the world too strongly, we experience the excess symptom ascribed to the large intestine law, heat destroying the teeth, tooth decay. In a deficiency, there is cold in the teeth or inability to chew. Now we are in the stomach low domain, the digestion processing of feeling. If we over-digest the excess, there is too much emotion without the ability to process or handle, hence the symptom of mania. If we are disinterested in taking things in, deficiency, we no longer move out to the world and the legs become weak. The spleen law gives context to our feelings so we can be nourished by them or reject them. In spleen lower excess, there is an over-eagerness to assimilate, and the gut is knotted with sharp pain. In a deficiency, we are unable to give context, and hence we are unable to eliminate. Therefore, there is fullness and distension in the gut. The heart law allows us to reevaluate and to articulate our feelings. In an excess, we try to over-articulate, justify, rationalize, resulting in pain and fullness in the chest. In deficiency, we are unable to articulate, and therefore there is inability to speak. Jeffrey speaks of the heart law also as an opportunity for liberating ourselves from our emotions. We can reevaluate the context given by the spleen, and this prodding to reevaluate is described as fullness in the chest. As we reconsider, the chest is being full. And when the process is done, there is complete freedom. There is nothing more to say. No need to hash and rehash. Therefore, no speaking. If we did not utilize the liberation path of the heart law, the emotional journey continues, and we arrive at the small intestine law, which tries to process, separate, analyze and manipulate. The small intestine is about separating pure from turbid. When that is in excess, there is looseness of the joints, too much manipulation. In deficiency, we are unable to let go, and the symptom is of pebble-like stools. At this point, we have not been able to give proper context, nor to let go of the emotion. It now starts to become pathological. There has been too much stimulation without the ability to process. In the bladder lower excess, there is a headache and nasal congestion, an attempt to shut off stimulation. In deficiency, there is nasal discharge and bleeding, an attempt to just discharge anything. Now that we have failed to give context to our feeling or liberate ourselves from it, it becomes paralyzing. We are now afraid of it since it has no proper context. Without context, any emotion can be, can be overwhelming. In kidney law excess, we are unable to let go of anything. We are in an overwhelmed mode constantly, and the symptom described is the blockage of the two yin, the stool and the urine. Kidney law deficiency symptoms are low back pain, the inability to move forward, a helplessness. We now mobilize all our mental habits, our patterns, our learned coping mechanisms to try and free ourselves. This is the pericardium law. All our habitual patterns get mobilized, resulting in chest pain. The pericardium law is a symptom of excess. In a deficiency, we are unable to do so and there is weakness in the chest or pessimism. There is nothing left to be done. All our coping mechanisms have been exhausted and we have failed to resolve our emotional issue. We now try to shake it off. The Samjiao excess shows it as spasms and cramps of the elbow from too much shaking and the deficiency as an inability to shake, showing as atony of the elbow muscles. The gallbladder law represents one more chance to use the emotional experience, now quite a mess, and shed light on it. Gallbladder 37, the low point, Guangming, bright light, or the light of understanding. 
If we can shed light and understanding, we can move or surge forward. The gallbladder law excess symptom is jue, often translated as inversion. The gallbladder lower goes downwards from Guangming, gallbladder 37, towards the foot into stomach 42, Zhong Yang, surging Yang. If I let go of the dampness and accumulations of my emotional experiences, the patterns, protective mechanisms, etc., I can see clearly and come back to my blueprint, the Chong. In a deficiency of a gallbladder law, the symptom is weakness of the lower leg with difficulty in walking and standing. This is lack of courage to face our emotional process, giving in, and hence there is helplessness. Now we have failed to let go of our emotional response, and it has taken over. We are now controlled by something that we feel is not ourselves. We become angry and alienated. This is the liver law, the final stage in penetrating into the blood. In excess, the symptom is frequent erections. This is an attempt to create a new self, to replace the me that I now hate. The liver law deficiency is itching all over. It is an attempt to shed this body, to shed the self. The next law is the great law of the spleen. The original feeling or emotion is no longer the issue. I am now upset at everything, invaded by everything. My emotions no longer have any boundaries, and I experience pain all over. This is the excess symptom. Or the joints are loose, which is the deficiency symptom. I am no longer able to give perspective to stimulus, feelings, or emotions. The sea of blood, the container of my emotional life, has been violated. Anxiety and depression take root with loss of appetite, loss of libido, loss of the will to engage in life. Life becomes extremely painful. This is the Ren law, where the excess symptom is pain in the abdomen, the skin of the abdomen, and the deficiency is the itching of the abdomen. Now I have been totally stagnated by emotional patterns and habits, and the head is heavy, deficiency of the Du law, and the back is rigid, excess of the Du law. Another model to look at the lower vessels is to look at the mediation of Wei Qi as it moves towards the interior, towards the blood. In this respect, we can say that the lower are an axis, kind of like the Shaoyang, and they are related to the diaph to diaphragmatic constriction. In the Shanghan Lun model of the lower system, the progression is through the zones and their associated law. The Taoyang stage is where we get nasal congestion, a bladder law symptom. The upper extremities are stiff, small intestine law symptom. As the Taoyang zone discharges, the symptoms move from excess to deficiency. In the bladder law, in the form of nasal discharge or bleeding, and in the small intestine law, through the bowels, pebble-like stools, there is an attempt to discharge through the bowels. The Taiyang stage represents our refusal to acknowledge and sense, smell, or handle with our arms the problem. This is the excess, and then an attempt to discharge the problem, the deficiency signs. Now the pathogen turns to heat in the Yang Ming. The stomach law is where we see the heat disturbing the Shen and affecting the throat, mouth, and eyes. And as it moves to the large intestine, we get toothache, the first indication it affects the body structure. As it moves further, and this zone empties itself, moving towards the interior, we see the deficiency symptoms of coldness of the teeth, or inability to chew, that is the large intestine, and weakness of the lower extremities, that is the stomach law. Here the body is unable to be active, and we're unable to move forward, leg atomy, and unable to digest information, cold tea. When no resolution can be achieved and all four limbs are affected, upper at the small intestine Taiyang level, lower at the stomach level, we see that the pathogen has taken residence as the four limbs represent the place where the primary meridian system has been affected. 
the sun jiao lo symptom of tight and stiff elbow and the gallbladder lo symptom of tight and stiff lower legs represent the place where exterior is communicating with the interior. Now we have come to a place where we have harmonized the pathogen. It has become part of our lives. We start to limit our possibilities and we develop yin lower vessels. In the Tai Yin zone lower level, we see heat. In the spleen lower, we see intestinal problems and discomfort. And as the heat moves further, it depletes the yin. And at the level of the lung, lower, we see hot palms, a yin deficient sign. The harmonization of the problem has allowed it to penetrate so that it now starts to eat us up. First, we get knotted in our abdomen and our ability to digest, that is to take in the world, and then it starts to consume the yin. At the level of the Shao Yin, we see that the peripheral circulation is being affected, putting a strain on the heart and the kidneys. The heart symptom being chest pain and the kidney symptoms are the inability to let go of things at the level of the low jiao, urination and stool. At this level, there is an accumulation of pressure on the inside without communicating and venting off to the outside of the body. Finally, at the Jue Yin level of the law, we see the chest and pelvis being affected, the pericardium symptom being stabbing pain in the chest, as in a heart attack, and the liver symptom of itching genitalia. The pathogen has invaded the center of our emotional lives and our reproductive lives. The heart has burnt and depleted the blood. We can also look at the penetration through the law as a Wen Bing idea, where Wei Qi, being young, produces heat. Heat in the Wei level is the laws of the lung, large intestine, stomach, and spleen, with wind heat being the lung and large intestine, and wind damp is the stomach and spleen. Heat in the Qi level is the heart, small intestine, bladder, and kidney law. The four bigs are the heart and small intestine law stage, and the bladder and kidney are the heat moving and blocking the bowels. The ying level is represented by the pericardium, sun jiao, gallbladder, and liver. And the heat in the blood level are the great law and the, and the law of the ren and the du. One other model that Jeffrey uses for lower vessels is again with regard to unacknowledged emotions and their relationship to the Wei, Ying, and Yuan levels. At the Wei level, an emotion is spontaneous. It is a mood. It is not controlled. It has no specific target. As it moves into the Ying level, it will be acknowledged, recognized, substantiated. The lower vessels act as a buffer to prevent us from having to fully, fully recognize and deal with the emotion. We now may suppress the emotion. We have recognized the emotion and have chosen to not express it. The emotion is registered, but its response is suppressed. Suppressed emotions are yin related as they have been consciously suppressed, usually to conform to societal dictates. Repression occurs not out of the desire or cognition, but as a survival necessity. Here, not just the emotional response is being pushed away, there is non-acknowledgement. Repressed emotions threaten and affect the UN level. We can also look at the lower system as how a mood at the Wei level becomes an emotion at the Ying level and a psychosis at the Yuan level. Jeffrey suggests using the lower points for the level of the emotion to affect that level and the law of the yang channel that is associated with the element of the emotion to affect the actual emotion. That is, use lung 7 and liver 5 as representing the law for the wei level, as lung and liver are associated with wei qi. Heart 5 or pericardium 6 and spleen 4 represent the level of ying. Kidney 4 and sanja 5 represent the level of the yuan. 
So for a mood, we'll use lung 7 and liver 5. For suppressed responses, heart 5 or pericardium 6 with spleen 4. And for repressed emotions, kidney 4 and sanja 5. Then we add the lower point of the emotions, yang meridian. Gallbladder 37 for anger. Large intestine 6 for sadness or grief. Small intestine 7 for joy. Stomach 40 for worry or anxiety and UB58 for fear. The lower channels are treated primarily by bleeding. When the blood vessels are prominent in the skin, the lower are manifesting as a fullness. Light tapping with a seven star needle is sufficient. Keep whiting the area with alkalized cotton, and once the cotton ball is stained, it means blood has been expressed. This can be done anywhere where blood vessels are expressed along the path of the channel, not just on the low points. Moxa can be applied onto the low points for a lower channel that is in the process of being emptied. For example, Moxa on lung 7 for frequent urination, a sign of lung lower deficiency. The sinew meridians are conduits of Wei Qi. Wei Qi warms, protects, and activates the upright posture and movement. Wei Qi symptoms include muscular problems, acute conditions like wind cold, wind heat, temperature changes, and headaches, with the head being where the Wei Qi homes to. Wei Qi is that which responds reflexively, in a spontaneous manner, without volition or recognition. It represents our ability to respond to the world, to change, and allows us to survive moving towards or away from the world without judgment. We need to move into the world in order to nourish ourselves. We need to engage with the world. We, in order to do that, we must first stand up so we can reach out. The sinew meridians all support the upright posture and the occiput, the base of the brain, where the experiences will ultimately be stored. Ling Shu 13 describes the order of the sinews as first articulating the leg yang sinews, then the leg yin ones, then the arm yang, then the arm yin. Jeffrey promotes a slightly different order. This order demonstrates the principle that we must first stand up, that is the leg yang, then we reach out and manipulate the world, those are the arm yang, so that then it can all be brought inwards, which is the yin sinews. <clears throat> the yin sinews do not have to be separated between the arms and the legs, according to Jeffrey, because when things come in, they come in from the legs and arms together, not necessarily arms first or legs first. Therefore, Jeffrey promotes the idea that the sinews begin with the opening of the eyes upon waking up with UB1, with the leg tai yang channel, the UB channel sinew, moving on to the leg shao yang, the gallbladder, to the leg yang ming, the stomach, this is establishing the upright posture. Moving to the arms, arm tai yang, small intestine, arm shao yang, san jiao, and arm yang ming, large intestine, establishing our ability to reach out with our hands to the world. Then bringing the wei qi in with leg tai yin, spleen, arm tai yin, lung, leg shao yin, kidney, arm shao yin, heart, leg chui yin, liver, and arm chui yin, pericardium. The yang sinews create our ability to stand up, our posture. The arm yang allows us now to reach out and grab, manipulate. The yin sinews move wei qi inwards for the movement of the smooth muscles of the intestines and of the heart and lungs. Moving out and forward is tai yang. Moving inwards or stopping the movement is yang ming. And adjusting the movement is shao yang. Bladder, tai yang, creates the upright posture, activating the outer foot, the gastrocnemius, engaging the glutes, supporting the spine, and anchoring the shoulders. Once the bladder tai yang sinews are activated, we have an upright posture and can move forward. Now we need to also move from side to side, to change direction, to rotate, to make decisions. This is the gallbladder shao yang which allows us to fluctuate and rotate 
especially by the activation of the area of gallbladder 34. And of course, we need to be able to stop. This is the stomach young Ming, activating the pelvis, the quads, the anterior shin to stop the movement. Now that the upright posture has been established, the movement is possible. The arm young sinews come into play to reach out and grasp. The small intestine Tai Yang supports reaching the arm out and away from the torso. The San Jiao Xiao Yang allows the rotation of the wrist and the hand. The large intestine Yang Ming allows for pulling in with the index finger. Now the yin sinews can take what we have come in contact with and move it inwards all the way to the pericardium so that judgment can now be made as to how to handle this information, how to classify it, how to detoxify it. This now becomes the domain of ying qi, the assessment of the world and how to use stimulus as nourishment. Our posture involves the sinew meridians and wei qi. It is often an unconscious habit that also reflects our emotions. Once again, we see that we cannot really separate the three levels. The way, our posture, and the yin, our emotions, reflect and influence each other. Our posture conveys how we relate to the world. The Tai Yang posture is that which rushes out to engage with the world, reaching out for new experiences. A sway back, stiffness in the neck, paravertebral tension, standing on the outside part of the foot. This is the extroverted posture. It can be a factor in back pain and be involved in overactive nervous and endocrine systems. The Yang Ming posture is the introvert posture, a sunken one, collapsing inwards with a caving of the shoulders and the chest, and the weight is carried on the inside of the foot. The tension here is a long Yang Ming in the abdomen and psoas regions. Yang Ming posture can be a cofactor in respiratory, digestive, in pelvic or gynecological issues, the areas being compressed. The Shaoyang posture is the tilted posture, perhaps standing on one leg, swinging the hips, or sticking one hip out. This is the hesitation posture, though it is often taken on as an attempt to look cool by sticking out one hip. This is uncertainty, fluctuation between Tai Yang and Yang Ming, and can come with migraines, TMJ, or one-sided symptoms. With regards to emotions, the Wei Qi, sinew meridians, are associated with moods. One has a general feeling, but the feeling has no target, and in being generally irritated, but not anything in particular, or being generally sad, but not knowing exactly why. Symptoms of the sinew channels can involve <clears throat> the fingers and the toes, the areas where we interact with the world, the eyes, which initiate contact with the world, the navel, the area where we started contact with the world, where the umbilical cord was cut, the back, where movement is initiated outwards. Tai Yang is involved when there is pain extending a limb away from the center line with a straight elbow or knee. Xiao Yang is involved when the pain is with rotation. Yang Ming is involved when the pain is when bringing a limb back towards the center with the elbow or knee straight. Tai Yin is involved with pain in moving a limb inwards with a bent elbow or knee. Xiao Yin is involved with pain in moving a limb out with bent elbow or knee. Jui Yin is implicated when there is lack of movement or paralysis. The only points associated with the sinew meridians are the Jing Well points. However, there are also meeting points for the three leg young sinews, small intestine 18, the three arm young sinews, gallbladder 13, the three leg yin, ren 3, and the three arm yin, gallbladder 22. The divergent meridians do not get a lot of reference in either the classics or in later texts. Jeffrey emphasizes the role of the divergence and discusses them as the channels that mediate Wei and Yuan Qi directly without the mediation of Ying Qi. 
In Ling Chu, chapter 11, the divergent pathways are described, and there is no further discussion on them, not even a list of pathologies that normally accompany channel descriptions. We have to take our clues from the question that prompted the description. The question sets the context that the human is the joining of heaven and earth, and that there are all sorts of correspondences between the Zhang Fu and nature. The primary meridians are involved in the birth, causes, and cures of disease and states. The question is then, what are the departures, unifications, leavings, and entries that help that process. Chi Bo then proceeds to give the description of the divergent channels. The pathways that are described show that the young divergents connect with the zhang of their yin counterpart and then reconnect with the channel, while the yin divergents do not connect or reconnect with their own channel, but with their paired yang channel. The young divergents are moving towards the zhang and the heart, that is, towards yin, while the yin divergents are moving to the yang channel. This brings us to the idea that the divergents are a layer that mediates yin and yang, joining heaven and earth in accordance with the Tao, thus allowing the yuan and the wei to communicate. It is joining wei and yuan, external and internal, without conflict, without yin. The divergence separate and also bring together the most spontaneous, the Wei, and the most constitutional, the Yuan, separating them from the yin, the primary channels, that is away from cognition, away from desire, satisfaction, naming, meaning, etc. These are the domains of the yin qi. The order of presentation is of Tai Yang bladder and Shao Ying kidney as the first confluence. That is the water element. Then Shao Yang gallbladder and Jue Yin liver as the second, the wood element. Now comes Yang Ming stomach and Tai Yin spleen, earth. Then the arms, Tai Yang small intestine and Shao Yin heart, fire. Shao Yang Sun Zhao and Jue Yin pericardium, still fire, and ending with Yang Ming large intestine and Tai Yin Mang, metal. At the center is the earth, spleen and stomach. We begin with the yin from within the yin, the water, moving to the yang from within the yin, wood, then the center, then yang from within yang, fire, and then yin from within the yang, metal. This is the representation of the Tai Chi in the five elements. This sequence represents the divergence as the capacity to accept the world as it is, the Yuan Qi, the self, accepting the Wei Qi, the world, how the self, the Yuan, moves out to the world, the Wei. Jeffrey also describes a different sequence based on zone which describes the Wei Qi moving inwards towards the Yuan level. This starts with Tai Yang bladder and small intestine, moving to Shao Yang, gallbladder and Sun Jiao, to Yang Ming, stomach, followed by large intestine, then Tai Yin, spleen and lung, Shao Yin, kidney and heart, and finally Jue Yin, liver to pericardium. For Jeffrey, the divergents have a close connection with the lymph system, connecting the major joints, the thoracic cavity and the neck. As conduits that connect Wei and Yuan, and being in harmony with the Tao of heaven and earth, we can see that this channel system that may describe a theoretical ideal of a harmony of self and world can also be seen as quite important in terms of pathology, and this is where Jeffrey places great emphasis in his discussions. The divergents are not supposed to have duality. Without the yin, the cognitive factor, there can be no conflict between self and world. Although cognition, yin, nourishes us, it also suppresses the so-called natural self, our natural reactions. A pathology in communicating outer and inner means conflict has a reason. 
That means a polarity, a concept or thought has taken place. Ying Qi has intervened. That polarity can be expressed as a problem on the right side manifesting on the left, or something in the upper body manifesting as a problem that is really in the lower body. That is diverting, polarizing. Divergent symptomology, according to Jeffrey, can also be wind symptoms, arthritis, or neurological symptoms. This is Wei Qi that moves towards the bones or towards the brain. The major joints are where the divergence start, and the brain is where they home into. In autoimmune disorders, the Wei Qi is turned against the self. The immune system is attacking the body. The Wei Qi is overactive and is at the level of the constitution, the UN. In cancer, nodules and metastasis are Jing, UN, that is now moving outwards towards the Wei. Allergies can be statements of, I reject the world and self-hate, or a statement of, I reject myself based on the perception I acquired from the world. These are pathologies in the communication of Wei, the world, and the innermost self, the Yuan. Issues that involve the lungs and kidneys can be viewed as divergent issues, the lungs being outer and the kidneys being inner. Therefore, asthma and edema can be manifestation of a problem in the divergent meridian level. Emotionally, the divergence, which do not involve ying qi, do not have an emotional component with cognition or with a target. The divergence are about letting go of desires and judgments. Divergent meridian emotional associations are of chronic, unspecific moods. The leg divergence involve fear, anger, and boredom, emotions that prevent us from standing up in or to the world. The arms, representing our ability to grasp life, are associated with emotions that prevent us from grasping the world, rationalizations, obsessions. The mood, emotion, or philosophical statement of the bladder kidney divergent is chronic fear of the unknown, where one is not sure what one is afraid of or why. The need to be a martyr without knowing why is a statement that is related to the bladder and small intestine, the Taiyang combination of divergence. The mood of the gallbladder liver divergent is chronic anger at life without being able to find a reason. Rigidity, inability to make change or to adapt to change, leading to frustration, as well as the inability to take one's place in life with honor, leading to resentment or contempt, are the emotional statement of the Xiaoyang pair, gallbladder Sanjiao divergent. The stomach spleen divergence emotion is lack of internal drive, lack of will to do something for oneself, and chronic boredom without knowing why one is bored. The small intestine and heart divergence represent the way we extend ourselves to the world, Taiyang, and bring it inwards to our hearts while sorting out the pure and the turbid. The small intestine represents how we rationalize things in order to understand them so that they will fit into our heart even when it is not quite willing to move in harmony with the outside world. The small intestine heart divergent is therefore associated with rationalizing in ways that are incorrect or disharmonious, like in trivializing, exaggerating, making excuses, or taking on inappropriate roles. The Sanjiao and pericardium divergence represent the way we develop our ego, creating a sense of status. The pericardium allows us to adjust to many environments. When this adjusting ability is hampered, we become possessive and we get envy and jealousy. When the Wei Qi is engaged with something that is not reality, the love that one has becomes a fantasy. The Sun Zhao pericardium diver divergence have possessive love, fantasy love, fixation and obsession and even delusion and mania as their emotional component, as a chronic mood. The final divergent is in the metal phase of large intestine and lungs, 
ultimately going out to the world, recognizing the world as a mirror of oneself. The proper role of this diversion is to allow us to put out the self to the world in perfect harmony so that my gift to the world is my own true self. The mood, emotion, or philosophical statement of the large intestinal lung diversion is over-examination of the world, over-scrutinizing. When the jing comes out, it can result in an attitude of feeling that one must always interact, always keep busy, always interacting. We have now looked at the human organism as the interaction between heaven and earth, its capacity to respond to the world, take in the world, spontaneously, wei qi, cognitively, ying qi, and intrinsically, or constitutionally, yuan qi. We also saw how the meridian system represents this capacity as well as representing pathology as it moves from level to level, becoming latent heat and latent cold, how the body works with pathogens in order to cope. How does that affect our treatment ideas? We now have a choice in looking at a condition of the body, whether a deficiency or excess, hot or cold, a climatic factor, and do more than just oppose it. We can see that it is part of a response pattern, and we can decide to support that response or to divert it. We do not have to just oppose it, as is commonly done in TCM. When we know the trajectory of the disease, you can, we can move it to the previous level. We may want to prepare that previous level first, so it is better able to handle the issue, etc. This will involve looking at which meridian system the pathogen is at and trying to move it in accordance with that system. The whole idea behind assigning pathologies and trajectories to the meridians is that it offers us a model through which we can see the progression of a problem and where the body has failed to cope with the problem, carried it further, complicating it further. In using such models, we can then prepare the body to re-engage, to fight again. But before we try to entice or invoke a different level, we need to ensure we understand the previous failings and address those. Otherwise, all we're doing is shifting the battleground to a place that has already proven to be unable to cope, and that shift will not be able to hold. So the model offers us not just a direction to move in, but also ideas of what weaknesses, what ignorance, what inabilities need to be addressed. And yes, there are times when one may need to move the pathogen further in, help the body create more latent cold, or help the body harmonize because the body is currently unable to face or work with the issues that are being provoked. Therapy is not a one-way ideology of getting rid of a problem. Therapy has to be intelligent and work with the terrain of each person. Sometimes that terrain means that expelling or creating a clear slate is not an option, but harmonizing or, or enveloping still is. This model also influences what herbal methods we use. When we just encounter an invitation to change, the body might fail to accept that change or to expel it. The attempt is to immediately expel, and that is the method of vomiting, total rejection on first sight. Next, we activate the Wei Qi. This means the pathogen has penetrated to some extent. It can still be expelled but it now requires some effort. Here is where the sweating and the purging methods are employed. Once this stage is exhausted, we can use the opposing methods, the cooling, the heating, and the draining. This assumes the body has enough energy to do that. This is confronting the issue by opposing it. When we're unable or unwilling to confront the issue, that is when the harmonizing method comes in. We learn to live with the issue without actually confronting it, and still live life relatively undisturbed by it. Of course, this harmonized situation may explode at any time, depending on what else is going on and the demands on the person's internal resources. Finally, 
When the person is too weak to confront the issue and has lost the ability to harmonize, this is when the tonification method is applied. We have to build up the person so that they can expel, confront, or harmonize. So we see that the treatment methods, the eight treatment methods of herbal medicine, also correspond to the body's natural responses to pathogens, to problems, to confronting the world. We can also look at herbs as, and the taste and the channels a little bit more closely in order to fit this model and influence our herbal choices through channels and tastes. Spicy herbs resonate with Wei Qi and with the sinews. And herbs that enter the lungs and the liver or the lungs and the bladder will also resonate with Wei Qi or the sinews. Bitter herbs resonate with the blood, the yin, and hence with either the lower or the primary meridians. Also, herbs with an affinity to the spleen, stomach, and heart channels resonate with the yin level. The divergence resonate with herbs that enter both the lungs and the kidneys, Wei and Yuan. Sour taste suggests movement inwards, astringing from Wei to Yuan, while salty softens the Jing and allows it out so as to communicate the Yuan out to the Wei. The sweet tastes affect all level, or it affects the eight extraordinary meridians. It is important to understand that each level also contains and reflects all other levels. Having the associations allows us choices. However, in Jeffrey's training, he spent periods of treating any and all diseases through only one meridian system as a way to get a deeper understanding of that system. This tells us that it is not the system we choose or even the points we use, but rather our intention as it is expressed through points, needles, and meridian systems. A theoretical example would be the treatment of jet lag, treating a person to reorient themselves to their surrounding environment. If we choose primary meridian strategies, we might choose the four gates, large intestine four and liver three, as representing the beginning and the end of the meridians, activating them to reorient as a sinew treatment, we may choose bladder 1 and gallbladder 22 to activate the sinews, the opening of the eyes starting the Wei Qi and gallbladder 22 being the meeting of the arm yin sinews being the last to articulate. An eight extra channel approach would be spleen 4 and sanja 5, as in orienting the self, the chong, towards the exterior, the yang wei. A divergent or windows of the sky approach might be UB10, Sanja 16, with Du 14 or stomach 12, the meaning of the yang, orienting the body towards the yang. Treatment modalities are also associated with different levels. Wei Qi resonates with breathwork, qigong, diet, because all these have to do with survival. Ying Qi resonates with circulatory therapies, acupuncture, massage, chiropractic, etc. Those have movement in them. Yuan Qi resonates with aromatherapy, chanting, etc. Essential oils are the jing of the plant, the essence of the plant, but they also affect our psyche, how we touch, how we smell, how we sense, how we see the world. Affecting the component of how we see the world, how we sense, affects the Yuan Qi. In treatments, I see Jeffrey exercising something I would call not knowing. He looks at the process of the disease, the problem, and then probes it, trying to move it, inducing change. According to how the body responds, we can now further refine our strategy. We may think that the pathogen, or the battleground, should be moved in a certain direction, but we need to be sure that this, is an, this new battleground can be won, so to speak. This is why you start to probe the problem and see what happens as it shifts. Will the person get agitated? Will they become calm? Will they cool? Will they warm, become damp, etc.? This tells us more about what this person is able to do with this stage of the problem that they're having. Now we're being able better to prepare them 
to be it emotionally or physically, to work and create awareness and strength at the terrain of the battleground that we're enticing them towards. I would like to end with some of Jeffrey's sayings. Jeffrey would encourage us to remember that at the end of the day or the year or whenever we take stock, we need to ask ourselves, who did I help the most in my practice? He suggested that it really should be you, that our practice of medicine, while helping other people as well, is really about us learning about ourselves and our own journey in the world, that it is really our own understanding of life through ourselves that allows us to help others. He would also say that when the healer becomes a true physician, he or she no longer sees people as needing to be healed. In our process of understanding life, we come to accept life. When I first heard Jeffrey pronounce this, it would not only made no sense to me, it provoked me. It sounded like the antithesis of compassion. It has taken me many years to come to terms with this statement, and I have come to see the wisdom it offers as embracing suffering as part of life. Jeffrey would say that the true acupuncturist does not need needles just as the true painter does not need a brush to paint. At the end of the day, this is a journey of self-discovery, which we as acupuncturists use, utilizing this medicine in order to explore who we are, where we're going, and how we might get there. We're always searching for better techniques, better tools, more intricate diagnoses, etc. But techniques, modalities, those are not the essence, they are just the tools.